We are thrilled to have him, and would you give him a River Rock welcome? God bless you, guys. Thank you, Pastor Marvin. It is a great privilege and honor to be able to speak to you again and give Pastor Marvin a much needed and uh, deserved break. Uh, even a Sunday, one Sunday off is is a nice break now and then. So he's uh, given me the opportunity to speak to you. A number of years ago, this was, I'd like to say, a long time ago, Glenn and I were sitting in a restaurant in Oak Grove having lunch one Sunday after church. And the place where I was sitting, I had a good view of the front door. And I'm a people watcher. So I'm watching people come and go. And, but then a couple came in that really caught my eye. There was a man and woman, both very nicely dressed. I think they probably just came from church. But what caught my eye was the fact that the man was quite a bit older than the lady, and the lady was quite attractive. And with all those facts available to me, that being that he was older than she, I came to the only logical conclusion about that relationship, that he must be very wealthy to have such a young and attractive wife. Can you say judging? Because that's exactly what I did. And almost immediately in my mind, I heard God speaking to me and said, who said she's his wife? Well, no one, Lord. Maybe it's his daughter. And I'm thinking, no. <laughs> Maybe she's his younger sister or niece or cousin. He says, you don't know. No, I don't, Lord. And what if she is his wife? What is that to you? Absolutely nothing, Lord, as none of my business. One of those conversations you've ever had, then it's kind of humbling and kind of embarrassing when God speaks to you that way. But God was telling me that what I was concerned about was simply none of my business. It was none of my concern what their relationship was. And he, of course, was absolutely right. Whatever their relationship was, was none of my business. And I had no right to pass any kind of judgment upon them. And this morning, I'd like to stand here before you and say that was the last time I've ever done anything like that. I'd like to be able to tell you that, but I can't. Because I still do from time to time, hopefully, hopefully less than I used to, because God often brings that event back into my mind. But it seems that sticking our noses in the places they don't belong is kind of a human trait that's common to all of us. We like to see what other people are doing, how they're living, how, how they're being treated, and pass judgment on them, their lifestyle, their situation they're going through. When in reality, that's none of our business. We like to sit in judgment upon other people, even complete strangers. And sometimes we even sit in judgment upon God. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, God is teaching the Israelites about a principle of the kingdom. And he is saying that if a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits sin, that he will die in that sin. But if a wicked man turns from his wicked ways and does what is good and right and just, he will be saved. And now it seems right to us, seems good, seems logical, but it didn't to them. Listen to Ezekiel 18, uh, verse 29. Yet the Israelites say, the way of the Lord is not just. Are my ways unjust, people of Israel? Is it not your ways that are unjust? Today we can be just like that. We can pass judgment on God and say, you're not being, judged. You're not being just. You're not handling this situation right. We don't like that maybe God is being nice to somebody that we don't like. We want to see him punished. Or those that we do like, he's not blessing them enough, and we want him to do it our way. And we say, God, it's not fair. You're not being just. You're not treating the person the way I think you should treat them. We stand in judgment upon God, sticking our nose in where it does not belong. And we can get so easily wrapped up in what's going on in other people's lives, so involved in their business 
then we can lose sight of what our business is. This happened to Peter shortly after Jesus' resurrection. The story is recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 21. Before I read the passage, a little background is needed. Most of us know that when, after Jesus was arrested, Peter denied Jesus publicly three times. Most of us are familiar with that. And we know that after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to the disciples on a few different occasions at least. We, we know that. And on one of those occasions, the disciples are out fishing. They didn't know what else to do. They went out fishing. Jesus appears on the shore. Peter recognizes Jesus, jumps in the water, swims to shore while the other guys bring the boat in. Then after a meal, Jesus has a very serious talk with Peter. We're going to turn to John chapter 21. We're going to read 15 through 19. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you were old, you would stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Now, Peter was just forgiven by the Lord. He was just reinstated as one of the apostles, and he was given his mission, feed my sheep and follow me. Now, that should have been enough for Peter. should have been enough for anybody. Peter's experience should have been enough for anyone. I've seen the resurrected Christ. I have been forgiven. I'm still part of the group, and now I know what my mission is. Should be enough, right? But it wasn't. Because Peter, like all of us, is still human. We're going to pick the story back up, reading verses 20 through 23. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following him. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at supper and said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked him, Lord, what about him? And Peter's referring to the apostle John here. Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? Peter stuck his nose into something that was none of his business, none of his concern. It was none of his business how Jesus was going to deal with John or any other disciple or any other person for that matter. Peter, who had just been given an idea of what his future was going to be like, gets busy, at least in his mind, comparing his future with John's. Well, what about him? Would John spend, be spared the things that I'm going to have to go through? Is he going to get special treatment? Is he going to get a better deal than me? Is he going to live longer than me? These are the kind of questions that I think might have been going through Peter's mind because I think that the kind of questions would be going through our mind if we were in Peter's shoes. You know, what about him? But Jesus responds to Peter's loaded question with, "Your your concern should be that you continue to follow me and not fretting over whether your brother gets special treatment or not. You have two things to do, Peter. Feed my sheep and follow me. That should be the only things you're concerned about. See, no disciple of Christ then or now has any business concerning himself with the way the Lord is dealing with someone else. It's none of our business. It's none of our business to compare our lot with theirs. Ours is to follow him. 
Peter didn't know it at the time, but John too would suffer greatly for his faith. Peter's sole care, his sole concern was to follow Jesus, to watch his own walk, and to discharge the responsibility to feed the sheep. The first, if you look at the four Gospels together, some of the very, very first words that Jesus spoke to Peter were, follow me. And the words that we just read here in John chapter 1 were last recorded words of Jesus to Peter, and it was the same thing, follow me. And the same applies for us. That's what we need to be about. On an earlier occasion than when we just read, Peter asked another question that's outside the realm of follow me. In the story of the rich young ruler, after the ruler had turned away and rejected Jesus' teaching, Jesus remarked to the group how difficult it is for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven. And after that statement, Peter speaks. Now before I read the passage, I just need to say this about Peter. Sometimes I think Peter gets a bad rap from Christians. Because he was a little bit outspoken, he was a little bit bold, he was a little bit presumptuous sometimes. But I, I think sometimes it's unfair to judge him in that way, because I think Peter did and said and asked questions that other people wanted to do and ask, but were afraid to. They didn't have the guts, but not Peter. Peter would ask them. And I think sometimes people were glad that Peter asked those questions, because they wanted to know too. So Matthew 19, 27 through 30, Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. Now Peter asks a question because it appears that Peter was expecting to be rewarded for his service. And so he asked basically, well, what's in it for us? We've left everything what are we going to get out of this deal? And Jesus promises them a hundred times of what they sacrificed here on earth and eternal life. But if we're not careful, we can overlook a very important condition of that promise. I'm going to reread part of that passage. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake, will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. The condition is this, for my sake. If you've done this for my sake, you will be rewarded. If you've done it for some other reason, deals off. Because see, the motive behind what we do is extremely important. When our motive is to do something in order to get something in return, then we've lost sight completely of what it means for Jesus to be Lord of our life. When our motive is for his sake, and out of our love for him and for the good of the kingdom, if that's our motive, for his sake, then we can be guaranteed that Jesus will keep his promises. But there is that condition, for his sake. And when we take our eyes off of him and begin to look around, at others and what's going on in their life and how they're being treated or blessed. Oftentimes our motive changes from, from for his sake to my sake. Well, I want that, so what do I have to do to get that? I want that kind of blessing. I want that kind of favor with God, so I want to start acting like that guy acts so I can get. And when we do that, we completely miss the point of his lordship. Or our motive can be about them even. But it needs to be about the Lord, his business, his sake, his kingdom. Instead of sticking our nose in where it doesn't belong. And we see this happening in the parable of the workers in the vineyard recorded in Matthew chapter 20. 
We don't have time to read the full parable this morning, but I encourage you to read it later. It's Matthew 20. But to summarize the parable, a landowner needs workers to work in his vineyard. So he goes out at 6 in the morning and hires a bunch of guys and says, I'll pay you a denarius, which was a coin worth a day's wage. That was the going rate. So he hires a bunch of guys at 6 a.m. Later, 9 o'clock, he goes out, hires some more guys. He said, I'll pay you what is right. Does the same thing at noon, again at 3 o'clock, and again at 5 o'clock. Now, the normal work day back then was 12 hours, basically 6 to 6. So at the end of the day, the landowner starts paying off his workers, and he begins to pay first the ones he hired last. And if you know the parable, Jesus gives these guys who worked about an hour, he gives them a denarius, a, a coin worth a day's wage. They only worked an hour. The guys who were hired first are thinking, oh, this is cool. These guys only worked an hour, and they get, they get a denarius. Man, we worked all day. We're going to get more than that. But they're all given the same amount. The guys who worked one hour versus the guys who worked 12 hours. They were all given a denarius. They agreed upon wage. But they began to grumble. Not fair. That's not right. He's not being, he's not treating us right. So listen to what the landowner said in Matthew 20, 13 through 15. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do with what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? It's a tough parable. Because we can look at it too and go, well, that's, that's not fair. But does not the landowner have the right to do what he wants? He didn't cheat anybody. He said, in other words, I paid the other, what I paid the other man, it's none of your business. I gave you what I promised you, a denarius. And that should be the only thing you're concerned about. You got what you were promised. And what we need to learn from this, I think there's a couple of things, and if we learn it, it can save us a lot of worry and frustration. And the first thing we need to learn is that God wrongs no one when he appears to be more generous or more lenient to one person than he is another. God robs no one. I mean, after all, he can do whatever he wants to do with what is his, and everything is his. So he wrongs no one. If the Lord appears to treat others with more generosity, with more blessings, with more provision, with more protection, than he does with you? Well, there's two things we need to remember. Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I think it's the thing that we need to remember when things go a certain way and we don't like it. Paul writes, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put, away, I, I put the ways of childhood behind me. Now we see but a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall be fully known, even as I, should, I shall fully know, even as I am fully known. The key words for us there is, I know in part. See, when we see things going on and God working with people's lives, we only know what we see. We only know in part. We don't see the big picture. We don't know the full story of what's going on in that person's life. We don't know what their heart is. We don't know how God is working on them and why he's doing this. We just see a little piece of the picture and we pass judgment on God. That's not fair. That's not right. The second thing we need to remember when dealing with God's things is what Jesus told Peter. What is it to you how I treat others? What business is it of yours, Peter? And in that case with that event in that restaurant, he was saying to me, what is that to you, Ken? None of your business. 
See, our business is to watch our own motives, to keep our eyes on Jesus, to follow him and stop looking around and worrying about what's going on in the lives of other people. Do you know we're actually told in Scripture to mind our own business? 1 Thessalonians 4, 11, and 12. And to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, you should mind your own business and to work with your hands just as we told you so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so you will not be dependent on anyone. Scripture tells us, Paul tells us, mind your own business. We need to take that scripture to heart. Now, none of this, what I've just said, none of it, and I I need you to hear this, is about being selfish or self-centered. This isn't about not caring about what's going on in the lives of other people. It's about making sure that we're running our own race, that we're keeping our eyes on Jesus and not allowing ourselves to be distracted by anything. It's about making sure that the plank is out of our own eye before we worry about a speck in someone else's. It's not about just being selfish and self-centered because we are to care about each other. We are to love each other. We are to be there for each other. And there are times that it is our business. There are times that it is our responsibility to get involved in the lives of others. For 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15 says, Take special note of anyone who does not obey your instruction in this letter. Do not associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed. Yet do not regard them as an enemy, but warn them as a brother. And then James 5, 19 and 20. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sins. And there's other verses along those same lines. So if we see a brother or sister in Christ doing something seriously wrong, and I'm not saying nitpick over every little thing they do wrong, but something serious is going on in their life, it is our responsibility, it is our business to go to that person and warn them about their actions. Or if we see a brother and sister in Christ wandering from the truth, We are to make it our business. We are to make it our responsibility to go to them and try to win them back. That is our business. Because that's about loving and caring for one another. And so while there are definitely times that we need to get involved in other people's lives, I think the bigger issue for a lot of us is getting involved where we're not needed, where we're not wanted. And sometimes we can be more concerned about what's going on in other people's lives than we're concerned about what's going on in our own life. And we have to realize that we can't change how somebody is is running their life. We don't have any control over them. That's That's between them and God. But we do have control in our own life, at least to the point where we can decide whether we're going to serve God or not, whether we're going to follow him or not whether we're going to keep our eyes on him or not. So we need to worry about our own life, our own walk. The plank is, again, in our own eye. So as as Jesus said to Peter, "What what is it to you about how I deal with John? You must follow me. Our dealings have got to be directly with God and not allow ourselves to get sidetracked by how God is working in the lives of of other people, that we need to be concerned about following God in our own life. Forty-five years after Caleb and 11 other men spied out the promised land, Caleb appears before Joshua. Promised land had been occupied and moved in. He appears before Joshua, and he asks for the land that Moses promised him 45 years earlier when he brought back a good report of the promised land. And Joshua 14, verses 6 through 9 says this. Now the people of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenzanite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. 
I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however, followed the Lord wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever. Because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Caleb didn't concern himself with what the other spies brought back as their report. He stuck to his convictions. He kept his eyes on the Lord. He didn't get concerned about what the other tribes were doing. He didn't get concerned about what tribes getting what land. That was none of his business. He just said, Moses promised me this land, and this is the land I want. He served the Lord wholeheartedly. Another place in Scripture, it says that he had a different spirit. Our whole concern should be that no matter what others may do or say, that we will be like Caleb and follow the Lord wholeheartedly. Would you pray with me?